Okay, so this week we're going to go over prokaryotes. And if you remember, prokaryotes are different than eukaryotes in a couple different ways. One, prokaryotes do not have a membrane-bound nucleus. Two, the prokaryotic cells are usually smaller than eukaryotic cells. And three, prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles either. And when we're talking about prokaryotes, we are not talking about a specific domain or kingdom. And the word prokaryote doesn't fall into a major taxonomy ranking. It really is just grouping the organisms in the tree of life that are not eukaryotes. So let's take a look at the tree of life to really understand what is going on here. So we're going to start with the major domains for diversity. And if you remember, domain is the most general taxonomic ranking. So we have three major domains. We have the domain bacteria, which houses all the bacteria. We have the domain archaea, which is going to house the archaea bacteria. And then we have the domain eukarya, which is all the eukaryotes. So these are the three major domains. And then underneath these domains, we have kingdoms within them. Underneath bacteria is pretty straightforward because the kingdom under the domain bacteria is bacteria. So we only have one kingdom underneath this domain with the same name. So this is under the kingdom bacteria as well as domain bacteria. And same thing with archaea. We only have one kingdom. And it's not until we get to eukarya that we see multiple kingdoms. So under eukarya, we have protista, plantae, fungi, and animalia. And what all of these have in common is that they're eukaryotic cells. All right, out of these three domains, these two, the domain bacteria and domain archaea, are what fall underneath prokaryotes. So these are your prokaryotes right here. So prokaryotes are really everything that is not a eukaryote in this tree. And going back to our phylogenetics lab, if you look at the root of the tree, what do you think that cell most likely was? A prokaryote or a eukaryote? Well, the first cells were prokaryotes. All right, they're very tiny. They didn't have any membrane-bound organelles, and they didn't have a central nucleus. And it wasn't until later that we see eukaryotic cells evolve, giving rise to this domain. Okay, so in this video, we're really focusing on the domain bacteria and the domain archaea. And we're not going to really spend too much time on archaea. But I do want to talk a little bit about the name. So we didn't discover archaea until later on. So we knew about bacteria and eukarya. And then when we finally discovered archaea, the first scientists that were observing it thought they were more ancient than bacteria, meaning that they branched off earlier on than bacteria. But as molecular testing became more frequent, such as DNA testing, we realized that these archaea are actually more closely related to eukarya than eukarya is to bacteria. So we had to rearrange the tree and put archaea here. However, the name stuck. And in, in Greek, archaea means ancient. So that's where the name came from, even though it's not really relevant to this group anymore. And we're going to look at some of the characteristics that archaea has that is similar to eukarya to see how these are more closely related or share more recent ancestor than the ancestor between bacteria and eukarya. Okay, so this table is just going over a lot of these structures that each one of these domains have. So eubacteria is just another name for the domain bacteria. So first thing we can see is cell types. So you can see that archaea and eubacteria are both prokaryotes. Well, eukarya is the only eukaryote. So think about the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and you already know a lot about these organisms. All right, next we could see the nuclear envelope, if they have it or not. And the nuclear envelope is really just the membrane around the nucleus. And since these are both prokaryotes, eubacteria and archaea do not have it. Well, eukarya is the only one that has it, since eukaryotes have a membrane around their nucleus. And the same thing with the organelles. So eukarya, or eubacteria and archaea are not going to have it, while eukarya does have it. Okay, something else that is different between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes is the, their rRNA which is making up their ribosomes. And, and if you remember, ribosomes are the chemicals that are going to synthesize proteins. Now, they have different structures for their ribosomes. So prokaryotes have something called a 70S ribosome, while eukaryotes have something called an 80S ribosome. You don't really need to know what these terms mean. They're referring to the sedimentation coefficients, which is just one way to kind of separate out different chemicals. But what is important is that both eubacteria and archaea have the same ribosome, the 70S ribosome, while well, eukarya has the 80S ribosome. So we see this other difference in eukaryotic cells versus prokaryotic cells. 
right, the next structure we're going to look at is the cell wall. And this is important. What cell walls are made out of are going to be different for each of these domains. So we're going to talk a lot about this a lot in this video. And under the domain bacteria, you're going to see their cell walls are made out of something called peptidoglycan, which are a type of amino sugars that are kind of that are linked by polypeptides. But this is very unique to this domain. So you're going to find this in their cell walls. And then underneath archaea, you're going to see that their cell walls are mostly made out of proteins. And this has a lot to do with where we find archaea. So archaea are also known as extremophiles, meaning they live in extreme environments, such as hydrothermal vents or hot springs. So they survive extreme temperatures and salinity. And because they're in these extreme environments, they have these cell walls that are made out of proteins because it gives them that extra protection that they need to survive in these environments when other organisms cannot. And then we get to eukarya, and depending on what kingdom we're talking about, we're going to see that the cell walls are made up of different chemicals. So under the kingdom plantae, we're going to see that their cell walls are made up of mostly cellulose. While under the kingdom fungi, you're going to see that their cell walls are made up of chitin. And not all eukaryotes have cell walls. If you look underneath the kingdom animalia, they do not have cell walls. All right, the next Characteristic that we're going to look at is histones, and histones are proteins that are used to wrap up DNA, to coil DNA, to make it condensed. And this is one of those pieces of evidence that show that archaea and eukarya share a more recent common ancestor, because look who has histones. So bacteria does not have histones, they're missing their histones. However, archaea and eukarya both have these proteins, and it was likely due to a common ancestor between the two of them. So histones are one of those pieces of evidence for this relationship between archaea and eukarya. And one of the reasons we had to rearrange the tree of life to make sure archaea is properly represented. And then the last characteristic we're going to look at is cell membranes. And here we're just looking at how the lipids are going to adhere to each other. So underneath the eubacteria domain, we see that they have ester-linked lipids. And the same can be found in the eukarya. All right, so we have ester-linked lipids for both of these. While if we go to archaea, we have more of an ether-linked lipid, and this is a stronger bond. And again, archaea probably developed this in order to survive these extreme environments. So this is a derived characteristic for this domain. All right, and also remember how much different in size prokaryotes are from eukaryotes. So this here is an electron microscopic image of a pinhead. And on here, you could see all the little tiny prokaryotic cells. So this is bacteria on this very tip of a pin. Well, over here, this giant ball is a eukaryotic cell, while everything around it are little pieces of bacteria that are attached to it. So you could see the size difference between the eukaryotic cell versus a prokaryotic cell. Okay, so we're only going to talk about archaea very quickly. And again, they're known as extremophiles because they survive in extreme environments. So just like bacteria, archaea are all unicellular. They are not multicellular. And really the major difference between being unicellular and multicellular is if your cells can survive on their own or not. So unicellular organisms can be colonial, where you have different cells that are working together to survive. But they're still considered unicellular because you could pick one of these cells off and put it somewhere else, and that cell will survive just fine on its own. Unlike multicellular organisms, which as humans, we are multicellular. If you took one of your cells, like it's, let's say a skin cell, and we took it off your body and put it on the counter, that cell will not survive. It will die. That's because we are multicellular organisms. Each one of our cells needs the other cells to survive. So these cells need to work together for all of them to survive which is different than the unicellular. So unicellular, again, could be colonial, but the cells can survive on their own. All right, one unique characteristic to the archaea bacteria, or just archaea, you could use either term, is that they're, that they're methanogens, which means they produce methane from carbon sources. And a lot of these are thermophiles, which is just a unique type of extremophile that could survive high temperatures or extreme temperatures. So it could be high or low. And some of them can survive temperatures as high as 190 degrees Fahrenheit, which would boil most other organisms. Well, a lot of these archaea are thermophiles. There are some that are halophiles, which means they could survive extremely salty conditions. So that's what this picture here is depicting. So these are the California salt flats. And you could see a lot of dense blooms of these cells in these salt flats. 
Okay, so that's really all we're going to mention for Archaea. We're really going to focus the rest of this video on eubacteria or the domain bacteria. So when we're talking about bacteria, there's two major groupings that we're discussing. There are heterotrophic bacteria and then there's autotrophic bacteria. So when we're talking about heterotrophic bacteria, we're talking about bacteria cells that cannot make their own food sources. They have to consume it in some way. They rely on other organisms to make or construct these organic molecules for them. And this is where you're going to find a lot of the decomposing bacteria. So decomposing bacteria are breaking down those organic compounds that are found in other organisms. And these decomposing bacteria are known as chemoheterotrophs, which is just a fancy way of saying they're heterotrophs that rely on chemical means to break down or decompose whatever organic material they're consuming. Now, most bacteria are heterotrophic. However, there is a clade that is autotrophs, meaning they can make their own food. Now, there are different types of autotrophs as far as bacteria goes. Some can use chemical means in order to produce their own food, but a lot of them use sunlight in order to produce food through photosynthesis. Now, these organisms that are bacteria that produce food through sunlight are known as cyanobacteria. All right, since they're photosynthetic, they have this kind of blue-green appearance, hence the cyano name, and they're still bacteria. They're prokaryotes that are related to heterotrophic bacteria. This is just a special clade of bacteria that are able to make their own food through photosynthesis. And it really wasn't until cyanobacteria evolved that we started seeing a lot of oxygen in our atmosphere. So without these bacteria, we would not have a suitable environment for a lot of the other organisms to evolve later on. So these are major players in producing the oxygen in our atmosphere. Okay, so we're going to focus on heterotrophic bacteria and how we can identify one from another because these are very tiny cells and all the cells look very similar. It's not like with multicellular organisms where you're going to have all these different structures that they produce and you can tell one from another. That's a little easier. Here we're going to have to actually look at chemical means to figure out one cell from another and to understand relationships between these bacteria. So one way we can distinguish one bacteria from another is by their cell wall. So there are two major groups of bacteria. We have something called gram-positive and gram-negative. And here we're looking at their cell walls. So the major differences between these two. Now remember, cell walls are found outside the cell, outside the major plasma membrane that is surrounding the cell. So here's the cell wall of a gram-positive bacteria. And it's a very thick cell wall. It's nice and thick, a lot of peptidoglycan here. All right, and if you notice, there's nothing above it. So you have this one layer of cell wall, this one layer of peptidoglycan that is covering the plasma membrane that is surrounding the cell versus gram-negative bacteria. So these are a little different. So again, we have our plasma membrane that is surrounding the cell. Outside of that, we find our cell wall. And if you notice, look how thin this layer of peptidoglycan is. It's still made of peptidoglycan. It's just very thin. It's a very thin layer. And in addition to that, we also have this second membrane. We have another membrane that is surrounding these cells. So po gram-positive, we have a very large, thick peptidoglycan layer with no extra membrane. While well, gram-negative, we have a thin peptidoglycan layer with an extra membrane surrounding it. So these names are coming from gram staining, which uses the chemical crystal violet to detect these two different types of bacteria. And what crystal violet does is binds to peptidoglycan and turns purple in the presence of peptidoglycan. So if we add this crystal violet to both of these cells, let's try to imagine what would happen. So again, crystal violet attaches to peptidoglycan and is purple. So which one of these cells are going to look more purple with the crystal violet? Well, the gram positive is going to look more purple for two reasons. One, you have a lot of peptidoglycan for that crystal violet to bind to. And second, you have nothing blocking it from attaching to the peptidoglycan. While in gram negative, you first have this extra membrane that the crystal violet has to get through. So that's going to slow down the staining process. And then you have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. So even if it does make it through this membrane, it's not, it doesn't have much to attach to. So it's not going to look nearly as purple. So that is one way we can chemically tell two different groups of bacteria. So we can look for their cell walls using crystal violet through gram staining. Okay, so one of the things you will need to know for this class is the process of gram staining. And so here are the steps to gram staining. So first what we would do is adhere the bacteria to a slide using heat. So we'd briefly 
pass this slide of bacteria over an open flame quickly, not so much where we cook the bacteria, but just enough where we fix the bacteria to the slide. And once we do that, then we can add the different reagents for gram staining. Okay, so the first reagent we would add is crystal violet. And if you remember, crystal violet is what's going to attach to the peptidoglycan of the cells. So once we add the crystal violet, we would then wash that away. The next thing we would add is iodine. And what iodine does is really fix that crystal violet and peptidoglycan bond. All right, so it strengthens that bond. So we can add further reagents without losing that chemical bond. So then we'd wash the iodine away. So now we have a really strong bond between the peptidoglycan and the crystal violet. And the next step we do is alcohol step, which is going to wash away any weak bonds that we have of the crystal violet. So any debris that is in the slide or the gram negative bacteria that doesn't have a strong bond with the crystal violet is going to lose the crystal violet. So the only thing that's going to still have crystal violet after the alcohol step is the gram positive bacteria. And the last thing we would add is a safranin step. And safranin is kind of a pink color. And what this is going to do is just make all the gram negative bacteria pinker to really give contrast between the gram negative and gram positive bacteria. So this safranin is not going to affect the gram positive stain that much, but it is going to affect the gram negative bacteria. So we could see this pink versus purple. And that's really how we're gonna tell gram positive versus gram negative bacteria. So that all the purple bacteria are going to be gram positive, meaning they have a thick peptidoglycan layer, while all the pink cells are going to be gram negative, meaning they have a thin peptidoglycan layer and an extra membrane. All right, so another way we can determine one type of bacteria from another is by their cell shape and arrangement. So the shape of the cells that they make and how those cells are sticking together. Now, on the left here, we talk about the three major shapes of bacteria cells. So when we're talking about heterotrophic bacteria, we can either classify them as bacilli, cocci, or spirilli. Now, with bacilli, or bacillus for singular, you have more of this pill shape or elongated rod shape of a cell. Now, comparing that to the cocci or coccus for singular, we have more of a round shape. So these cells are more rounded versus spirilli or spirillum for singular, which is more of a spiral shape. So this is one way we can determine one type of bacteria from another, just by the shape of their cells. And another way is how those cells are arranged or sticking together. So a lot of these bacterial cells will grow in some sort of colony where they have cells sticking together and different species or different genus of bacteria cells are gonna have different formations or arrangements of these cells. So if a cell is by itself or they tend to grow by themselves, we call this single-celled. So in that case, we would just call it by the name or of the shape of the cell. So here would be coccus. But the one below that, if you notice, sometimes these cells can come in pairs of two. Now, when this happens, we have this prefix here called diplo, and what diplo means is two. So what we're saying here with this prefix is that they're going to come in groups of two. So the whole name of these cells is diplococcus, meaning coming in groups of two, and the cells are circular. And then we have another arrangement called strepto, and strepto is more of a chain. So the cells are going to be attached to each other in a chain. So here would be streptococcus, since these are circular cells. And then finally, we have staphylo. So staphylo is more of a general grouping of cells. So this could be in two or three dimensions, but you just have this clump of cells that are sticking together. So this would be a staphylococcus example. Okay, so now we're going to try to practice using the, these different ways to determine one heterotrophic bacteria from another. So what you're going to do here is, in a second, you're going to pause the video and see if you can determine if these cells are either gram-negative or gram-positive and what their cell shape and arrangement are. Now, when it comes to cell shape and arrangement, you have to be careful because sometimes you could have, say, a streptococcus bacteria, which is going to be circular cells that grow in chains, but they might be really close together or very compact, and so they're going to look staphylo. So what you need to do is look at the majority of the cells because sometimes the cells just weren't spread out enough to really see the correct arrangement of the cells. So look at the majority of the cells, and that should be their arrangement. All right, so go ahead and pause the video, take a second, and see if you can determine whether each one of these pictures are gram-positive or gram-negative and what their cell shape and arrangement are. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through these just to see if you got them correct. So starting with this first one, 
um, just looking at it, if it's gram positive or gram negative, you could tell that it's pink. It's more of a pink color. So these are going to be gram negative bacteria, meaning they have a thin peptidoglycan layer and an extra membrane on the outside of the cell. And now if we're looking at cell shape and arrangement, we could see that these are coccus cells. We have these circular cells everywhere. But the arrangement is a little tricky. So if we looked over here, we might assume that it's a staphylo arrangement. Or if we looked over here, we might think that it's a single cell. But again, we have to look at the majority of the cells. So the majority of the cells come in twos. So these are actually diplo arrangements. So this is diplococcus. Now going to the one next to it, whether it's gram positive or negative, since it's pink, it's gram negative again. And here the cell shape is spirillum. So this is a spiraled shaped cell. And just as a rule of thumb with spirillum, they never come in different types of arrangements. The cells always come singularly. So when we say a cell is spirillum, we already um, immediately assume it's a single cell. So we do not need to say diplo, strepto, or, or staphylo with these cells. Then we come to this one, and you can tell it's a little bit more of a purple color. So this is going to be your gram-positive bacteria. And here, looking at the cell shape and arrangement can be a little tricky. I mean, you could see that they're circular cells, so we know they're going to be caucus. But what is the arrangement? Well, if we look over here, we might assume that it's a staphylo arrangement, which is not really the case because these are actually strepto chains, but in this area are just really close together. They weren't spread out enough on the slide to really determine what they are. But if we look at the rest of the image, you can see that in tons of locations, we have these chains of these cells. And since the majority of them are chains, we know that these are streptococcus bacteria. All right, coming to this one now, you could see it's purple. So this is a gram-positive bacteria. And again, if you're not careful or looking at the majority of the cells, you might think it's staphylo, when really it's strepto. So these are long chains of cells that are bonding together. So this is strepto formation. And if you look at the shape of the cell, it's not quite circular. It's more pill-shaped. So this is actually a example of bacillus. So this would be streptobacillus. That is gram positive. Now, how about this one? So this one is pink, so it's going to be gram negative here. And if you look closely enough, you can see that it's a strepto formation. You have chains. But you really have to look close to see the cell shape. So these cells are actually more elongated than they are round. So these are bacillus cells. So this is another example of streptobacillus, except this one is a gram negative, meaning it has a thin peptidoglycan layer and a cell extra plasma membrane. And then here is a gram positive, meaning they only have one membrane and it's a very thick peptidoglycan layer. And then finally we come to this last one and you can see it's purple, so we know it's gram positive. And if you look closely enough, you can see the cells are caucus in shape or round. But now the question is, is what is their arrangement? Well, some of these may look strepto. That one almost looks like a chain. While other ones may look diplo. The majority of the cells are actually in the staphylo conformation. So these clumps of cells. So again, you got to look for the majority to really determine what the arrangement here is here. So this is actually a staphylococcus example that is gram positive. Okay, and many times with heterotrophic bacteria, the genus that they fall under is their cell shape and arrangement. So the genus will be named after their cell shape and arrangement, and this is really just to help with identification. All right, but it's actually very useful. All right, so let's just take this example here. So we have this genus species of a certain type of bacteria. So here's the genus, which is Streptococcus, and then we have the species name. And if you remember with the phylogenetics lab that we did last week, the species names in a lot of times can identify a certain characteristic of the group underneath this genus. Okay, so let's just start with the genus. Streptococcus, what do you think these cells are going to look like? All right, so since they're strepto, they're going to be in chains. And since they're coccus, they're going to be round cells. So right off the bat, we know what these cells are going to look like. And then we have our species name that kind of groups out this specific species from the genus Streptococcus. And pyogenes means pus producing in Latin. All right, so you might have been able to guess what bacteria this is. It is a pus producing bacteria that is Streptococcus. This is the bacteria that causes strep throat. All right, so strep throat is where the species name is coming from because it's pus producing. And if you looked at the cells in our microscope, this is what they'd look like. All right, they are long chains, strepto, that are round, coccus. All right, let's try another one. How about Staphylococcus aureus? All right, so 
let's go to the species name first. So aureus means gold in Latin, and it has to do with their appearance. But how about Staphylococcus? What is it going to look like? Well, the genus tells you everything. Staphylo meaning it's going to be clumps of cells, and again, the cells are going to be round. So you might have been able to figure out what an organism this is. So Staphylococcus aureus is the species that produces staph infections. All right, and if you looked at this bacteria under a microscope with no staining, this is what it looked like. So Staphylococcus, meaning that they're round and clumped together, so large clumps of round cells, and aureus, meaning gold. They're actually more of a gold appearance. So if you grew them on a Petri dish, you would see that the colony would be more of a gold color. All right, so those are the major ways we can determine different types of heterotrophic bacteria. And we're going to talk about cyanobacteria here in a second, the autotrophic bacteria, which uses different naming systems. So again, these naming systems only work for the heterotrophic, not for the autotrophic. All right, but before we get into that, it's important that bacteria aren't all bad. All right, there's a lot of different relationships with these bacteria. Some can be mutualistic, where both organisms benefit. A good example of that is the bacteria that is found in your gut. These bacteria are helping you break down the food that you eat, and you probably would not be able to survive without them. So that is a mutualistic example of bacteria in eukaryotes. Some bacteria can be commensal, where they are benefited from living next to or with another organism, and the other organism is not impacted whatsoever. But a lot of bacteria can be parasitic, where the bacteria is benefiting, but it actually can hurt the other organism. So this is one of the examples we're going to use for a symbiotic relationship. So this is a symbiotic relationship from a heterotrophic bacteria known as rhizobium and the plant clover. Okay, so this relationship's been going on so long that clover plants actually develop special structures to hold these bacteria. So they hold the bacteria in root nodules. So this is where you're going to find the bacterium rhizobium. And here is a cross-section of one of these root nodules. So you could see all these different cells of the plant that are in here. And they're pink because there are tons of different little tiny rhizobium that are inside the cell. So they're housed intracellularly. Okay, so let's, let's talk about how each one of these organisms benefit. Well, the clover is going to help the bacteria because it can give it some of the stuff it makes through photosynthesis. So it can make a lot of sugars through photosynthesis, and it can give some of it to that bacteria, the rhizobium. But what is the rhizobium giving the clover? Well, one thing bacteria are really good at doing that other organisms cannot is nitrogen fixate. All right, and nitrogen fixation is when you take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into more usable forms of nitrogen. And most organisms can't do this. And it's because atmospheric nitrogen comes in this form, N2. And if you looked at this chemical, the bond between the two nitrogen atoms is triple bonded. That is a very hard bond to break. And not a lot of organisms have the tools to do so. However, some bacteria do. They're able to break this bond and then turn this nitrogen into a more usable nitrogen more usable form of nitrogen like ammonia. So that is what the rhizobium is doing for the clover. It is nitrogen fixating the nitrogen, turning it into a more usable form of nitrogen, and then giving it to the clover, which the clover needs. So this is an example of these two organisms helping each other out. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the autotrophic bacteria, and specifically the photoautotrophic bacteria, which are called cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria is a clade of bacteria that are able to produce their own food through photosynthesis. Okay, so first things first, could we actually use gram staining to figure out if these bacteria are gram positive or gram negative? Well, most likely not. And it's because they already have these photopigments that are in the cells, in the plasma membrane of the cell. So if you try to stain this cell with the crystal violet, you're not going to get very conclusive data because these photopigments are going to interfere with the staining process. So you can't just simply gram stain it to figure out what kind of cell walls they have. But luckily, cyanobacteria all branched off from the same common ancestor, and that common ancestor was a gram-negative bacteria. All right, so all cyanobacteria are gram-negative because of that common ancestor. So if you ever see a cyanobacteria, you already know something about its cell wall. You know it has a very thin cell wall of peptidoglycan, and they have that extra membrane. All right, again, cyanobacteria are photoautotrophs making food through sunlight, and one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen, and they are responsible for most of the oxygen in our atmosphere. Before cyanobacteria ever evolved, there was very little oxygen in our atmosphere. 
So that kind of just shows you how much of an impact that these organisms had on the world. Okay, so let's talk about some of their photopigments. So all photosynthetic organisms use the photopigment chlorophyll A in order to photosynthesize. That is true for all photosynthetic organisms. However, it's a lot of their secondary or accessory pigments that differ from one photosynthetic organism to another. And with cyanobacteria specifically, they have a unique accessory pigments or secondary pigments called phycobilins. All right, there's a lot of different types of phycobilins, these secondary accessory pigments, but the only two that we're going to cover is phycocyanin and phycoerythrin. And looking at the name, you could tell a lot about the color that it reflects. Now, if you remember something about photosynthesis, the color that the photopigment appears is the wavelength that is not being absorbed by the photopigment. All right, so with phycocyanin, it has the name cyanin because it, it looks a blue-green color, a cyan color, which means it's absorbing all the other wavelengths of light except for the blue-green wavelengths, that it's reflecting those colors, and that's why it appears that color. And then they have these other phycobilins called phycoerythrins. Now, erythrin means red, all right, just like your erythrocytes, which are your red blood cells. So the root here is erythrin. And again, these are going to absorb a lot of the other wavelengths of light, but except for red. It's going to reflect those wavelengths. All right, so out of these photopigments, cyanobacteria mostly have phycocyanin and chlorophyll A. So that is why they have this kind of blue-green appearance, and a lot of times they're referred to as the blue-green algae. All right, so let's try this critical thinking question, though. All right, they're photosynthetic. And if you remember with plants, what do plants use for photosynthesis? Well, they use chloroplasts to photosynthesize, which are organelles inside the cells of plants that are photosynthesizing. Do cyanobacteria also use chloroplasts? Well, actually, they don't. If you remember, cyanobacteria falls under the domain bacteria, which is a prokaryote. And by definition, prokaryotes do not have membrane-bound organelles, so they do not have chloroplasts. Well, if they don't have chloroplasts, then where are all these photopigments being housed? Well, the photopigments are actually being housed in the plasma membrane of the cell. So you're going to find them in the plasma membrane surrounding the cells. All right, and the last thing we're going to talk about is how the colonies can be formed. Again, these are unicellular, not multicellular. So even if they come in colonies, you could take any one of these cells and it'll do just fine on its own. But we use a different naming system for these colonies or these arrangements than we did with the heterotrophic bacteria. If you remember with the heterotrophic, we had single cell diplo, strepto, and stat flow. Well, in cyanobacteria, we either call them single cell filaments or colonies, where single cells are cells that just are by themselves. Filaments are actually long chains of cells, and the colonies are more three dimensional or clumps or groups of cells. So just keep in mind that we use a different naming system when it comes to cyanobacteria. Okay, so important, some important information of cyanobacteria. One, they are very good nitrogen fixators. They do an excellent job of taking that nitrogen out of the atmosphere and turning it into more organic or usable nitrogen that other organisms can use. So not only do they produce a lot of oxygen that we find in the biosphere, they also produce a lot of the nitrogen that we find in the biosphere. They're not all good though. Sometimes we could have rapid blooms form. And when that happens, there is a lot of issues that it can cause in the environment. A lot of these cyanobacteria can produce a toxin. And if they produce toxins and they have these dense blooms, they're going to release a lot of toxins into the environment, which could kill a lot of the different organisms that are there. And on top of that, not only do we have these toxins being released when the blooms are being formed, but if we have a dense bloom of cyanobacteria, they're eventually going to run out of nutrients. And when they run out of nutrients, what's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to die and then decompose, probably from heterotrophic bacteria. And decomposition requires a lot of oxygen. So when these dense blooms die and are decomposing, the decomposers are going to strip the environment of oxygen. So you can get these dead zones from these blooms where there's no oxygen when they're decomposing. Another benefit of cyanobacteria, though, that they, is that they have a lot of proteins in them. All right, so we actually farm cyanobacteria to make protein supplements. There's a lot of different cyanobacteria that we could do this with, and that's because they're so good at making proteins. Okay, so this is just an example of a cyanobacteria bloom in the St. John's River. So here this happened from microcystis, which is a type of cyanobacteria that makes a toxin called microcystins. 
So two things happened when we had this bloom. One, we had a lot of toxins being poured into the water around here, which is killing a lot of different organisms. And sometimes that toxin can aerosolize, get in the air, and it affected a lot of the people that are around here, especially people with respiratory problems because they were breathing in those toxins. On top of that, eventually they ran out of nutrients. So this bloom stopped growing and died. And when that happens, these, all of this dense bloom started decomposing due to heterotrophic bacteria and other decomposers. And since decomposition takes a lot of oxygen, we have this dead zone of no oxygen in the water, which can cause a lot of different organisms to die. So those are two major ways that these blooms can impact the environment through the toxins they release when they're growing and from the lack of oxygen or these dead zones when they're decomposing. Okay, so now we're going to talk about different examples of cyanobacteria that you will need to know. And a lot of times these cyanobacteria have unique names because they look so different from each other. And remember, we don't use the whole coccus, bacillus, and spirillum with cyanobacteria. Those terms are reserved for the heterotrophs. And same thing with the cell arrangements. Okay, so the first genus that we're going to cover is Oscillatoria. Whenever you see SPP, that means a bunch of different species underneath this genus. So we're really just focusing on this genus right here. And with Oscillatoria, they are filamentous, meaning they grow in chains like this. So this is one filament. Here is an individual cell. All right, so a lot of times these are described as being books on a bookshelf. That's what their colonies look like. So that's an easy way to identify oscillatoria. All right, so here are individual cells inside a filament. All right, the next genus we're going to look at that you will need to identify is Merismopedia. And these are more colonial than they are filamentous because they're growing in two dimensions here, not just in chains, but in two dimensions. Here's all your individual cells. And with Merismopedia, they do a couple of unique things with their colonies. So most, like most cyanobacteria, these are aquatic. But these colonies are going to produce something called a sheath. And this sheath is this material that is encapsulating the colony. And this sheath is full of gelatin. We call this a gelatinous matrix. So we have this gelatin that's inside the sheath. And what these cells are doing are passing nutrients back and forth to each other through this gelatinous matrix that's inside this sheath. Now, these colonies are flat, like a piece of paper or a sheet of paper. And this helps them in two different ways. So when the colony is sitting horizontally like a sheet of paper, it increases their buoyancy, allowing the colony to float to the surface of whatever water they're in. And if you think about it, this is a very beneficial thing to do because they're photosynthetic. So they want to be able to float during daylight hours when they can photosynthesize. So they will lay in this horizontal position in order to float to the surface of the water. But at night, when there's no light, there's really no reason to be up here. And honestly, it's kind of dangerous because a lot of the predators that are going to eat you are going to be looking for you up near the surface. So during night hours, these colonies can then flip on their side, being more in the vertical position, which decreases their buoyancy, allowing them to sink. So then they can get away from the surface of the water at night. So by changing the arrangement or how the colony is positioned, allows them to float to the surface or sink to the bottom. All right, the next cyanobacteria we're going to look at is spirulina. And spirulina is kind of indicating one of the characteristics of this genus. And it's because they had this very spirally shaped filaments. All right, so these, this is about one cell right there. So this is a colony of cells that are growing in the spiral shape. All right, and remember, these are cyanobacteria, so we don't use those same terms as the heterotrophs. We would not consider this spirillum. That is a term reserved for heterotrophs. This is a specific genus called spirulina. And spirulina are one of those cyanobacteria that we farm because they're so good at creating proteins. So a lot of the protein supplements that you buy from the grocery store are going to be from the cyanobacteria. All right, so the last genus you will need to know is anabina. And again, anabina is going to grow in a filament form, so long chains. And anabina is pretty unique because they actually create special cells inside these filaments. So here is a regular cyanobacteria cell or anabina cell. And it's very, it's photosynthetic. It has all the material that any other cell would be. When we're talking about the regular cell of cyanobacteria, we call them vegetative cells. So these are non-specialized cells just doing what any other cyanobacteria would do. But then we have a couple specialized cells that can develop in these colonies. So the first one is a heterocyst. 
And a heterocyst looks very similar to the vegetative cells, except it's lost a lot of its photosynthetic material. And that's because it is removing a lot of this photosynthetic material to make room for material that can create or fix nitrogen. So these cells are very adapted to fixing nitrogen, which it can then pass to the other cells in the colony. So again, these are more of a clear shape because they're losing their photopigment to make room for nitrogen fixation machinery. And they're able to do this because the colony can then pass sugars that it's creating through photosynthesis back to the heterocysts. So you kind of have this relationship going on between these cells of the same species. And then we have this other specialized cell over here called an aconite. And these cells are usually very large compared to a lot of the other cells. And they're usually packed with smaller cells that act as spores, meaning they're going to be used for dispersal. And aconites are beneficial because they can survive pretty tough conditions. So what would normally happen as these cells or these colonies grow, if say, let's say they run out of nutrients, all these cells are going to die all right, as they run out of nutrients. However, the DNA is still housed inside these aconites, which can uh, be dormant for long periods of time. So even though all the other vegetative cells die, the DNA still survives inside this aconite. And so this can remain dormant until conditions are good again. So eventually the nutrients are going to come back. And when that happens, then you can start having new vegetative cells being released from these aconites. Okay, so the last symbiotic relationship we're going to cover is a relationship between this aquatic plant fern called a zola and those anabina cyanobacteria that we just talked about. So here is the plant. It is a water fern. It floats on the top. And here are its different leaves. And if you looked inside these leaves under a microscope, you will see these long chains of anabina housed inside these leaves. Okay, so let's talk about what the benefit of this relationship is. What do you think the plant is giving anabina? How is anabina benefiting from this relationship? Well, the plant can photosynthesize. All right, so it's using photosynthesis to give sugars to the anabina. But anabina can photosynthesize too, so why would we really need this relationship? Well, both the anabina and the azola need nitrogen. They need nitrogen in order to survive. Well, if the plant is doing all the work of photosynthesis, that gives the anabina more freedom to produce more nitrogen. So because of this mutualistic relationship, the anabina can produce way more nitrogen than it would normally, allowing both of them to benefit. So it'll pass the nitrogen to the plant and use the nitrogen for itself. All right, so just as a general critical thinking question, since anabina can live on its own or it could live in the symbiotic relationship with the Zola, which anabina is going to have more heterosis? Do you think anabina that lives on its own or anabina that lives in a Zola that is going to have more heterosis, those specialized cells that make nitrogen? Well, you would find more heterosis in the anabina that's inside a Zola. And that's because this anabina inside the azola does not need to use so many cells for photosynthesis. All right, that is a limiting step here. So since they ha are able to free up more cells because the plant is doing all the photosynthesis, that gives them more freedom to create more heterocyst cells out of those vegetative cells. Well, the anabina that's living on its own needs to be able to photosynthesize more to support itself. And so it has to sacrifice a lot of those heterocysts in order to photosynthesize. So here we're freeing up those cells for heterosis. So you'll find a lot more heterosis in Azola. All right, so that's everything that we're covering in this video. We talked about the three domains. We talked about eubacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And we focused on the different prokaryotes, which is the eubacteria and archaea. And then we talked about the different types of eubacteria. So we have heterotrophic bacteria and then autotrophic bacteria, which is your cyanobacterias. And then we discussed on how to identify those different types of bacteria and some of the unique things that they do.